So we're going to talk about the inner ear. The organ for hearing is the cochlea, and for balance and equilibrium, you have the vestibular system or the semicircular canal. Both structures are located within the inner ear, and they share fluid, but the vestibular system has nothing to do with hearing. Here's a picture. Again, we have our outer ear, our middle ear. The stapes footplate sits at the base, at the beginning of the oval window of the cochlea. And the three semicircular canals are on the left. The cochlea is on the right. Remember the vestibular system is involved with balance and the cochlea is our hearing organ. If there's a problem in the cochlea, you have a sensory neural hearing loss. Now it can either be sensory, meaning the cochlea, or neural involving the eighth cranial nerve or higher up. The organ of cordy is our specialized organ of the ear. It acts as an acoustic intensity and frequency analyzer. It's contained within the cochlea. It's this small snail-like shell that's approximately 3.5 centimeters. It's filled with fluid, just one droplet of fluid. So your cochlea is basically the size of a dime. It's so tiny and intricate and it's amazing what it can do. There are hair cells. They're not real hair cells. They're just uh, cilia on the organ of cordy and they contain these top pieces called stereocilia. Now movement from the middle ear bones pushes on the cochlea. It propagates a wave of fluid along the cochlea and different areas are stimulated based on the frequency of sound. So the movement of the wave causes a shearing of the hair cells on the membrane of the cochlea. And the size of the electrical response sent to the auditory nerve is directly related to the shearing. So the hair cells function to transform this hydraulic movement of the inner ear fluids into electrical impulses. The electrical impulses generated from the hair cells stimulate nerve impulses in the auditory nerve, which transmits these impulses to the auditory centers of the brainstem and the brain. You can have areas of normal hearing sensitivity and areas of profound hearing loss. When the cochlea is damaged, and this is for people who maybe have had, had hearing and then lost it later in life, not necessarily for children born deaf, but the loss of hearing sensitivity is not the only complaint. People may also complain of understanding speech. So the number one complaint of an adult who has had hearing and then lost it is that they can hear, but they can't understand. So again, it's audible, but it's not intelligible. The left is a picture of what your healthy outer hair cells look like, and the right is damaged outer hair cells. So it's these outer hair cells that move up and down in response to the traveling wave, and they signal to the inner hair cells that it's time to fire the auditory nerve. On the left, you have an unrolled cochlea, and then on the right, we're looking down on the cochlea. Now it's tonotopically organized. When I say that, I mean it's organized by frequency. So high frequency sounds are processed at the base at the beginning of the cochlea, and low frequency sounds are processed th further up. There are hair cells specific to every frequency of sound that we could hear. And the traveling wave will go to those hair cells. It will tip the stereocilia, trigger them to move up and down, telling the inner hair cells that it's time to fire the auditory nerve. Now the auditory nerve and the auditory cortex is also very complex. You have ascending afferent fibers and descending efferent fibers. So afferent messages are sent up to the brain and efferent messages are sent down and out. If you hold your hand over a fire, afferent nerve fibers tell your brain it's dangerous. Efferent nerve fibers pull your hand away. 
When I was in graduate school, my friend would take the E train home. So he always said that to remember efferent fibers, he thought of exit. The E train exits its home, exits him to home, and efferent fibers send messages down and out, exiting. So as the sound messages go up, there are these series of complex processing. There's recording. Um, there's processing and reprocessing and processing and reprocessing, and it's called intrinsic redundancy, and it sends the messages all the way up to the cochlea. I mean, up to the auditory cortex, I'm sorry. And all this analysis and reanalysis is what helps to separate speech from noise. So it's this intrinsic redundancy that helps us discriminate speech sounds from noise sounds. See? So you have your two cochleas, then you have areas of processing and reprocessing and sharing all the way up to the auditory cortex, and that creates the intrinsic redundancy.